Welcome to the We Are Libertarians 2020 Presidential Campaign Series. I am joined by Chris Marks, and he is running for president here in 2020. I'm your host, Hody Johns, and I am happy to be with him. Chris, how are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you very much for having me on here and giving me this opportunity to speak to the rest of the Libertarian Party. Yeah, no problem. You know, there's some that I've had at least a rudimentary amount of interaction with. You uh, came out of the woodworks. You're suggested by somebody within our own Weird Libertarians group. And so I'm, uh, I truly know nothing about you, which will make some of these questions even more exciting than they usually are, because I don't know what you're going to say. So uh, first things first, every other question is going to deal with politics to some degree. So let's start, let's just say, tell me about yourself family, friends, occupation, just whatever it is you do that uh, is not politics related. Just give us the overview of who you are. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm a simple man. I'm a family man. Just wanted to be the best father I could be. Uh, I am very proud indigenous individual of the Miami people that are native to the, ter to the territory known as Indiana. Um, I enjoy science, technology, and engineering. I come from a business management background, which was my original professional, uh, professional career. Then I switched over to information systems, where I've dabbled in programming as well as troubleshooting. And that has ultimately made it easy for me to understand the politics. That makes sense. So that takes us to the next question. Let's talk about your liberty journey. Now, yours is a little, uh, little more unique and a little more recent than some of the others, but just what led you to, almost nobody's born with this idea of liberty. What, what's kind of got it in your system, the libertarian journey? How is it, how has it led to this point? Well, you know, I think it starts with publicly, I'm a family law reform. Uh, CPS abolishists, uh, social secu security reform, and American Indian Affairs activist and advocate. Um, I got into understanding what I do about politics uh, through the law, really. Um, I have been forced into poverty almost my the entirety of my adult life through child making uh, a child support payment of 55% of my gross income. Um, to child support, and it turns out through my explore my exploration of the law that this is um, actually federally incentivized due to the federal government mismanaging people's social security trust fund monies. Um, that made me meet some very interesting people along the lines uh, through the family law reform movement and stuff along the. Uh, stuff along those lines. I met uh, Cash Jackson out of Illinois. I met C.J. Abernathy out of South Dakota. And those both, both those people joined the Libertarian Party, ran for governor of their states. But I recognize that a lot of what the family law reform movement's based around is actually coming from a federal level. Um, these are not constitutional. Uh, the government, it, they, but Everybody posts it, it poses these family law reform issues as being a state's issue, but when you understand that it's coming from the federal level, I'd like to actually see that change and see it change for the better and for everybody. I can see having a federal program that is incentivized to keep you poor probably makes you want to change it. Uh, yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> so um, let's let, let's start. So we're actually going to start at the top and head down and get lower. We're going to pretend that you've already become president and then we're going to get, we're going to back it up and see how you get there. So when we talk about your presidency, let's talk about the top three problems that you're looking at that what you see when you look at America and how the Chris Marks presidency would help fix them. So just give us a, I mean, start at one. What's your biggest number one issue that you'd like to tackle and give me your solution. Well, um, I think that the biggest problem with it facing our nation is the two-party system, what it represents, what it, and most importantly, what it doesn't represent. 
when you actually explore the party platforms of the Democrats and the Republicans, the Democrats work for state privilege and interest, the Republicans work for corporate privilege and interest, and the people, while being taxed, are left unrepresented within their, within their governments. Um, I want to actually, I, I want to actually do something to change that. What I want to do in, re, in that regard is I want to go through all of the executive orders that have actually come out of the Emergency Powers Act and repeal all of them. Um, like, uh, if, like what was done with Abraham Lincoln suspending the habeas corpus and Franklin Roosevelt issuing the executive order 9066 that placed Japanese in intern camps. Um, many of these executive orders run in series and have solely eroded away the people's constitutional rights. And while many of them have been overturned, there are many still in place that are continuing to infringe upon in people's individual freedoms. Wow. Yeah, the, uh, the executive privilege is, I think it was, uh, it was Obama who said his biggest regret was leaving the lo a loaded gun in the White House for Trump. Because, well, you know, he, he issues the executive orders and then he says, well, now you saw how I issued him. So now you can have the previous authority to yeah. you know, keep doing and, and that is and, and that is because when an executive order is placed, it put into place, the Emergency War Powers Act actually suspends, uh, suspends the Constitution in some way, shape or form. Um, that's what we saw with the Patriot Act, and that's what we've seen through many other things. Yeah, it uh, uh, it's a it's a it's a fascinating history, but it's a really scary history for when you look at the executive orders. Uh, so, what's problem number two, and how you would uh, tackle it? Um, problem, problem number two, I would say, is our corporate government. Um, hey, we do actually have a government, a corporate government. It's, uh, you can look it up, 28 U.S.C. 300215A is the federal statute. Um, but this federal, but this corporate government is actually supposed to be by the people and for the benefit of the people. Um, when you understand that our government is a corporation, but this corporation doesn't have any honest business practices, that are ethical in any way, shape, or form to run on to sustain itself. Yeah. Um, that's where I see that the problem is. What other business is there that you can think of that literally doesn't have a revenue, an honest revenue stream? Well, it's our government. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to actually um, give our government an honest revenue stream. One of the things that I'm a very big proponent on because I am a uh, I'm very interested in environmentally friendly um, businesses is a solar roads program, not like what we've seen here done here in the United States, which have been epic failures, but the China as well as the Netherlands both have very successful solar road programs actually in the works right now. Um, and when you take and you understand that if we were to task our government with generating renewable energy resources to generate money, and these were done as a roads program, then our roads wouldn't actually cost us money, they would be making money for us. And just as with a business model, you want to invest in a company that is going to pay you back dividend payments. Um, I would like to see that come out of our government. Something like it, it's not free. Nothing any anybody does is free. It's all funded with with something, you know, whether it's taxes or or inflation or something. Uh, you would actually have it be well if it's going if the government's going to do it, then people will pay for it and enjoy it. And it's something that they would rate that they would voluntarily pay money for. Does that sound accurate? Well. What it, what you end up doing is the legislate the federal legislation that I would like to actually be this program to be based off of would establish that the people um, the people's money that the people's tax contributions actually were used to generate this this renewable energy, therefore they own that energy. And then that amount would then come out of their individual electric bills. Yeah. Um, 
And then the surplus energy that these road that these roads programs and this renewable energy, all renewable energy resource programs that would come out of this legislation would then um, be able to make it to where the states individually could sell the surplus electricity to the corporations at a cheaper rate. Hmm. That then that money that is being now sold uh, gained from selling the electricity to the corporations will still be held it will be held in a trust fund for the people one third of that one third of that value will then go into the trust fund monies to um convert the people off of fossil fuels and natural gases over to being able to make a be able to use electricity so you don't have, if you want, you, you apply for the, you would apply for this program. You'd be able to actually replace your he, natural gas heater, water heater for an electric water heater, an energy efficient thing. Um, and then the government would have this two third surplus, the profits to sustain itself. This ultimately would mean that you, uh, the tax contribution from the people would ever uh, become ever increasingly less um, to the point where the government then became a self-sustainable business model. Wow. I can tell you, that, that's more creative than uh, a solution to that, that, uh, that energy crisis than I think I've ever heard before. But uh, it, it's, well, I say creative, you definitely have the legal backing for it. Um, all right, let's, let's move on to problem three. Okay, um, and problem three, I would say, is the way that a, the U.S. dollar system is based. If you look into Money Mechanics, which is published by the uh, by the Federal Reserve Banking System, which is privately uh, privately owned, which is what prevents we the people from auditing the valuation the valuation of the Federal Reserve. You come to understand very quickly that the dollar system domestically is based off of how much in debt the people are to the US dollar while internationally the US dollar is it is valued based off of how much controlling interest we have in how foreign governments exchange their petroleum that's the reason why it's called the US petrodollar yeah um utilize going back to my solution to problem number two in the solar roads program, what I'd like to see us do is be able to get to a point in this nation where we are domestically producing so much renewable energy resource electricity that we now can create a an Article One, Section Eight new form of currency, a constitutional form of currency, where or where we actually mint our own coins, or we look into maybe nationally look a, um, exploring a cryptocurrency, a, a national cryptocurrency kind of situation. Yeah. Um, this would then in turn make it to where we were, we would end up being able to, as a sovereign nation, uh, come to a resolution and end the uh, business relationship that the United States has with the Federal Reserve banking system while not damaging our credit rating. Right. You know, uh, alternatives to currency is, is something that I've always been passionate about, something that I've talked a lot of on the podcast. I, I think it's amazing that I haven't run into you before this just because I tend to talk about it a lot, especially online and, and, there's that difference between economics and currency, which a lot of people don't understand. And I think really going at the currency could help fix a lot of that. Um, all right. So let's, uh, let's talk. Okay. So I'm going to take the presidency away from you. Thank, thanks for your, yeah. for that. Um, let's, let's try to get you through an election. So let's you've already won the libertarian um, nomination. Even if every libertarian comes to vote, you're going to get, 15, 16% of the vote, if every single one shows up. So we're going to need to borrow from the other parties. And this is where I'm going to ask you a question of why someone from a different party would vote for you. Someone with, with a different leaning might vote for you instead of the candidate that would naturally represent them. So let's start with the, let's start socially. And let's talk about the social liberals, the left of the country. They are concerned about the, the, uh, 
the disparity in payment. They are upset about the way minorities don't have the opportunities that that uh, the majority whites do. They are concerned that these social situations have become so political and now it seems like it have to, has to be addressed by politics and they're worried about seeing these things get out of control. Why would they vote for you instead of whoever the Democratic candidate is? Well, um, that's, a, that's actually a really good question. One of the things that I, uh, that I kind of pride myself on is being able to um, – actually get people from the Republicans as well as the Democratic parties to look at me. And I've, I've actually done a number of these things. Um, unfortunately, they've been on other third party uh, media sources uh, and podcasts, stuff along those lines. And I've, I've repeatedly gotten the same comment. I'm going to have to take a look at the, uh, take a look at this libertarian party. Um, you know, when we're talking about social disparity and stuff along those lines, what, like I like I discussed in my own personal liberty story, I understand that the social security system that is that is right now in its current state being mismanaged by the federal legislative branch. It is the federal legislative branch is paying out over fifty billion dollars in an, annually to the state governments to do things that. While they're only paying out thirty less than thirty billion dollars a year to the individual trustors who have contributed to the Social Security trust funds, and my one of my main focuses is going to be going into them and it, going into the federal the federal government as the executive, and I'm going to repeal the 1974 Social Security Act as amended to date. This is a primary problem within our society that is actually causing the fiscal insolvency of the social security system. So that is going to help out the elderly, the disabled, and the disenfranchised right off the bat, as well as it's going to stop the disparity of a great many parents all across this nation, myself included. Wow. Um, so now let's flip it to the other side of the aisle. Let's talk about the social conservatives. There, there's always laws that are being kicked around where they say maybe we could have churches pay taxes. It seems like once a year we, you know, there's a cross that's visible from the road and they have to take it down. Um, there's family values. There's traditional marriage. There's worry about immigration. What would you say to a social conservative that would make you appeal to them more than it'll probably be Donald Trump, but whoever the Republican is? Well, I think that I think that one of the main things that I can actually bring to that conversation is that um, one churches being a cross being visible from wherever that's a freedom of expression if you want to put a church a cross up in your front yard then that's your for that's your right of a right to freedom of expression you go put that cross up in somebody else's yard now you're actually trespassing um and that yeah that would be where things got a little bit hinky um where traditional values, quite frankly, I think that we need to get back to traditional values and the way that we're going to be, we're going to be able to actually get back to those traditional values. We're going to have to actually take and do a massive overhaul. We're going to have to stop incentivizing the states to actually cause the breakdown of the nuclear family. Um, you know, they're, uh, like I said, I'm a CPS abolishist. Uh, the little known thing, in fact across this nation is the same thing that Donald Trump's administration is being having their chops busted right now over what's going on with it, what happened with ICE and the immigrant children. That is happening all across the nation right now through the child, uh, through the child social welfare programs. Um, we need to put an immediate stop to these things. And this will then re-solidify the family. Now, if you've got a family court situation where you're saying, okay, well, you're going to get rid of uh, child support. What about these single parents? There's a solution. If, that if, if the courts have deemed that there is a parent that is disenfranchised and that they need help with their children, that's exactly what the Social Security Trust Funds are meant for. And there will be that money available to actually make this 
kind of monetary contribution to help them keep them up on their feet. And that's what we need to do. Great. You know, I probably should have asked you about the economics first, because it seems, and, and, and I agree with you. In fact, this is something the Cato Institute talks about, is that the economics freedom helps lead to social freedom. So we start with the social freedoms. You've talked about some of the economic freedoms, but uh, let's reha let's see if you got anything else in the in the tank there. Let's talk about if I'm an economic left leaning person, and I just hate seeing corporations get bailed out. Um, they're always taking a look at these food stamps and social programs, and they're always down on those. But here it is: we got these billionaires who are paying paying nothing in taxes. Um, Obviously, there's a wage gap issue as well uh, that they're concerned about. What would you say to someone who's kind of uh, left-leaning economically, and why would they vote for you instead of whoever the Democrat is? Well, it, because it, the reason why they why they would be interested in me as a candidate is because when you understand that the Democrats' objective is to push up on state-run programs, which end up increasing the tax demand, okay? And then you've got the Republican parties pushing down on the corporate tax contribution, which is where you're talking about those bailouts, where you're talking about those, uh, those loopholes that make it to where these other people are paying their fair share. And I'm not talking about them paying an exorbitant amount. I'm just talking about them paying what their, uh, what their percentage of their tax contribution that is deserving um, underneath the current situation. When you get back to that limited privilege to govern, the government only has the limited privilege to govern over those who have committed a crime, as according to corpus delicti, and those who are in, in, in businesses that are involved in the, in, in the Commerce Clause. You know, I don't believe that people are involved in the Commerce Clause when they're, when they're exercising their right to freely contract. Um, and that, and so there's going to be that aspect where I'm going to be looking at as soon as possible abolishing the income tax, where I'm going to be making it to where we push down on the demand for tax contributions. And now this is going to be beneficial to both the people as well as the corporations. But I put things in the forefront of people first, then corporations, and then what is it that the state is allowed to do, whether or not we're talking about the state at the state of level or whether we're talking about state at the federal level. Yeah, makes sense. The uh, Commerce Clause has been badly misinterpreted and gone through so many judicial rulings, it's hard to even recognize what it was originally intended for. Yeah. Uh, so let's... Uh, Let's flip it again to the other side. You've got the economic right. They have seen government grow and grow. Usually the only thing they're worried about is our defense. Everything else they'd be okay with seizing, seeing go down. Why would they be more interested in you than uh, Donald Trump's uh, re-election? Well, I think, that it, I think that when you come down to even speaking in regard to the defense program, uh, the defense system, the national defense, and you look at what is actually motivating our military actions throughout this throughout these United States. We go back to what a, what our dollar system is based off of. Every one of our every one of our military actions has been motivated to control foreign sovereignty's um, exchange of their national GDP. Um, we don't need to be involved in all of that. We don't need to be involved in these war actions to control the product exchange, uh, production exchange of somebody else's GDP products when we ourselves can then take and turn our eyes inward at what we can do as a nation. I think we've spent far too long as a nation looking outward and judging those around us rather than looking inward and seeing what the, what we can do, the best we can bring to the table. And I think, and, and call me an optimist if you will, um, but I believe that America can do significantly better than it currently does. No, that's a, that's a fascinating point you bring up, and it's something that I've thought of before. It's we constantly are trying to copy countries that are, doing, that are going into debt, 
but not quite as badly as us or have a socialized program that still makes mistakes, but it's, you know, maybe a few less mistakes. It's like when you're copying a, a paper and you're looking at, well, this guy's going to get a D plus, this guy's got a D minus and you just want, just, isn't there some other solution out there? You know, that that's, I, for me, that seems more American letting the entrepreneurs and the, and the really the visionaries kind of try to take, take care of the problems. Um, Again, I hate to back you up here, but let's uh, let's try to get you through the primary now. So okay. you're running against, the, um, presumably, you've met uh, some of the other, or at least heard of some of the other libertarian candidates and, and what they stand for. And uh, there's a lot of different factions within the libertarian party. Uh, and this is coming from a guy who's Republican, and I understand there's pro-choice Republicans. It is nowhere near as factionalized as the, as the libertarian party. And you kind of got to unite a lot of different cats. And so let's talk about, let's talk about the libertarian left. We have our libertarian socialists. There's mutualists. Which of those, why would they, why would they consider your, your campaign as far as libertarians go? They're concerned about freedom, but they're also, they, they hang on to those, those left values and really want to make sure that those are represented and they haven't got a lot of representation, frankly, out of the candidates that we put up recently. Well, I think that one of the things that I can, well, one of the things that I think that I bring to the table that the rest of the other candidates, and I spent hours last night watching the interviews that you've done with uh, some of the others thus far. Um, one of the things that I bring is I bring that transitional view to the, uh, to the Libertarian Party. Um, if you come into this society and you say, I'm here to shake things up, people don't like that boat being rocked like that. And that's where you're going to find somebody like me. An America, if I'm, I'm, a, I'm an absurdity. I'm an American Indian federalist that is a, a, a strict, hardline constitutionalist. Um, and if you actually understand the culture, the the background history there, you would understand. You'll understand how silly that is for somebody to say. But it's absolutely true. Um, and when you come to understand that this society doesn't want the boat rocked wildly, we need to make a transition back to those individual freedoms. I don't want to take you back all the way to the Wild West, like what I've kind of discerned from some of the other candidates. I want to step it back to, I want to step us back to a time in, a, a time in, the, in American history when we were more civilized, we had more, we had more freedoms, but um, with the same modern views, because we have to admit that there are many modern views that we wouldn't want to we wouldn't want to sacrifice. We wouldn't want to sacrifice um, the segregation movement. We wouldn't want to sacrifice the labor uh, the labor movement. We wouldn't want to sacri sacrifice the uh, the women's liberation movement. You know, we have to do something to maintain these certain modern ethical and moral values that we currently have while stepping back to a more free, a free time and era. No, that makes sense. They, uh, we have, uh, and, and as much as I think the heart of me loves the, the radicals, but I also want it to actually happen. You know, I want, I want freedom to actually happen. And it's just so... We talk about it all the time. It's one of the reasons I moved from politics to media is because I just felt like I wanted to start changing the culture and people's ideas and ways of thinking instead of trying to be the guy that tells them how to think or believe in me, I'm good at thinking for you. Uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, a good point there. So let's talk about the libertarian right. You've got a ton of capitalists over there at the Mises Institute. Um, you sound like a really learned guy as far as this. You get the monetary supply guys that are worried over there. Um, what, what would you bring to the table for them? Well, I think that what I'd bring to them is, uh, you know, capitalism, I, I think that, you, you know, we have to have a free market in our nation 
but we also have to have that regulation that, it, that is afforded through the Commerce Clause. We don't want to overreach in that regard because when you do that, then you start making it to where businesses don't want to conduct business here. Um, but we also want to create that draw, and I think that that's what I'm trying to ultimately do with the Renewable Energy Resource Program. Think about it this way. When you have a surplus of electricity that you're selling to a company cheaply, it's going to create an incentive for them to move their – set up shop within your territory. Um, and it's going to keep them here uh, – keep them located here in the United States. It will afford our, go our state governments uh, to pick and choose based off of what kind of wages those businesses are offering to their constituency, as well as uh, also offer them the opportunity to be more discerning about what kind of businesses they allow in their area. What is their pollution rate? Um, I, because when they come back to it and they understand that the land they have allotted to them from the federal government um, is all they are going to have, then they're going to maybe want to it, take a change and look at it because they're going to be less desperate to actually go, we're going to do some, uh, we're going to do some more environmentally friendly changes. I think that that's what we're seeing coming out of the Democratic Party right now with this new green, uh, this green new deal, yeah. which I don't like, but I also do appreciate certain aspects of it. Um, so I think that it, while it, but I'm a, but I'm one that says that you cannot sacrifice um, the bad or the good for, or the bad for the good. Um, and that thing has got far too much bad in it. Yeah, there's a, I love the green part. I'm not so big on the, control everybody's wealth and, and over to, you know, gut every single house and, and all yeah. the crazy things in there. I mean, they've, uh, they've taken it down. They're reworking it a little bit, but we'll, we'll, we'll see if they manage to get, uh, get it into something that's actually controllable. Um, so let's, I feel like this may be a challenge for you. Let's talk about the extremes of our party. And this is the anarchists. And this is the, I barely want, I don't want government to exist at all. Forgive me, not barely. They don't want it around. They bar they don't even feel great voting unless the person is pretty strict about taking it all down. What would you say to them? We have, I would say, the majority of our candidates, even that you're going to be going against in the primary, are anarchists, are self avowed. I would say at least half of them are self avowed anarchists. Yeah. At least, at least they've told me at some point. So how would you then get that, get that um, they're very excited, a very radical part of the party, uh, to vote for you instead of somebody else who's like, yeah, anarchy? You know, honestly, um, I've actually had this conversation with a couple people. Um, the individual that I'd like that I'd like to actually bring on as a VP, as a VP for my platform would be Adam Kokesh. Um, he would be like Mike Pence to Donald Trump, that, it, that, that figure that sits in the background that if you were to actually take out Donald Trump, you would know that you would end up with Mike Pence leading the ship. Um, and uh, I like Adam Kokesh. He's well-spoken. I like his, his viewpoints on individual freedoms. Um, whether or not, I, while while a great many of the anarchists would look at me and go, you're, part, you, you're still continuing the system. I am, but I'm working on creating programs to back the system off. Think about it this way. If the government has a, it has a business model that it's, it, we have to admit, government is greedy. Yeah. It is just inherently run by greedy people. Sure. And if you give them a program, the Solar Roads program, and you say, here is an honest revenue stream, you get to keep two thirds to put into your operational costs. One third goes into a, a, a trust fund to help convert the people off of these natural, re, uh, these natural gases and fossil fuels and stuff along those lines. Mm -hmm. But you get to keep two thirds for your operational costs. And they start going crazy with that. They lose their focus on messing with the people. 
They're not worried about that anymore. They're going to be worried about filling their coffers. And their way they're going to do it is by generating renewable energy. They're, this is a social benefit. It distracts the greedy and the corrupt within our governments. And it would, and ultimately, what do you end up with? You're not going to end up having an electric bill. You're not going to end up having a gas bill if you apply it, apply to be a part of these programs. Um, in the end, because they're they're using two thirds of that money to pay for their operational costs, you're not paying taxes to the government to sustain its operation. What does this mean? It means that you get to keep more of your hard-earned wages. You get to spend those hard-earned wages as you want, locally, regionally, nationally, internationally. Um, and you get to, and that is the embodiment of free market enterprise. It really would be something else to see the politicians we have today attempt to, attempt to be, I guess, just be incentivized to run it a uh, department well instead of run it poorly and then need more money afterwards. So it is definitely something that I think is uh, unique. Yeah. It is unheard of. If you want to pay raise Congress, you yeah. have to produce more renewable energy resources. If you want, if you want, a, like that would be the whole thing. Oh, you need more employees in this department or that department. And now keep in mind, when you go back and you start repealing all of those executive orders, you start also repealing all of the deep state agencies like the NSA, like the CIA, all of those agencies, their doors get shut down. Yeah, because the executive order that actually keeps them operational is now repealed. And that's what I'm ultimately going after. That's going to be how we do hashtag budget cuts in the Mark's 2020 administration. Yeah. Awesome. Let's talk about uh, let's talk about the moderates now, the minarchists, the small government guys. They're just sick of it growing, frankly. In my view, and I talked with Adam Kokesh just the other day, he, uh, he wanted me to correct how I say this, but it seems like they're the ones that put up most of, uh, that show up to, the, to all of the conventions. They supply the delegates. You get a lot of the, the small government guys that, uh, that believe that change comes in a suit. So what would you offer them in order so that you could uh, survive and, get, and, and make the primary and get into the election? Well, you know... Um, if you want a guy in a suit, uh, you, you can catch me in a suit all day long. Um, you look great in a vest, by the way. He's, he's I look good. <laughs> I look good, and I bought it cheap. I go to <laughs> I go to thrift stores on half price day. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, so if you're looking for somebody that's going to be that's going to dress the part, I'm your man. If you're looking for somebody that's going to actually understand the economics, to understand the legal uh, the legal jargon, that's going to understand where the problem actually comes with, and it's got a just a unbridled zealous um, desire to actually dig into a problem to figure out how to resolve it, hire the IT troubleshooter. <laughs> <laughs> can't go wrong with that awesome uh, awesome man no that's uh that's great that's a great summation so let's uh let's talk some nuts and bolts here i have uh i have worked on a presidential campaign before um they're terrible they're time consuming uh the president himself or herself i guess in my case it was himself uh doesn't have time to do almost anything except fundraise. How are you, do you have a plan in place to make the, the it's a crazy amount of time to get the funding together. How are we going to put together a campaign for you? Well, that's what I, one of the, one of the things that I'm excited about actually doing this with you is I am looking to put together a grassroots campaign as well as campaign team. Um, I want. I'm. I'm a low budget guy, low maintenance guy. I've. You know, I've traveled out to Missouri, um, and slept on. A, actually, they put me up in a nice hotel out there. Um, I've traveled. When I travel around, I'm not. Un, it, it's not uncommon. To, it common to find me sleeping in somebody's recliner or on their couch. I'm not a high dollar guy. 
Um, I want to get more active out there. I want to make my rounds, I, but I need a campaign team to do that. And I'm hoping that through this, we can bring together a campaign team of people that are going to, that are interested in bringing a transitional candidate for the Libertarian Party that is going to be able to be appealing to both Democrats as well as Republicans um, to actually bolster those numbers for the Libertarian Party as well as somebody that's going to speak to these Democrats and Republicans to kind of misguide, to re-guide them back to liberty. Um, and that's what I want to do. Uh, I want to I want to take the Republicans. Those people those people are concerned about their jobs. They're concerned about their economic stability and stuff along those lines. But they've been misled by that party. And the Democrats they want it, they they want their fair shake in life. They want they they want to make sure that they that this nation is taking care of them. And as an American Indian, I know from my culture. Uh, what happens when you are dependent on government social welfare programs? It is not ever a good thing, but we can do it better for you. And we need to put those people first. And we can, and I can take from the Democratic Party, and I can bolster those numbers of liberty. Awesome. So, one more time before we pitch your campaign, why are you the best libertarian candidate? I can't honestly say that I am the best libertarian candidate. I, what I can say is that I have a moral compass that I believe that I know what is right and I know what is wrong and I will not be wavering and I will not be, and I am incorruptible and I will always stand up for the people over the state and the corporate interest. Um, I want to be the voice for the people. And I, and I need that help from everybody out there. Awesome. Well, that leads us to our last question. Let's say I've heard you. I really love what you have to say. I'm very interested in your campaign. Where do I meet you to sign up? How do we get this ball rolling? Um, I've actually got a uh, Facebook page set up for underneath Christopher Marks for President 2020. Or you can find me on Facebook uh, underneath Chris Marks. Um, I always have a, uh, I always have the banner, uh, vote Liber I vote libertarian on my, uh, on whatever picture I have up. Um, and I am very, very welcoming. I am always willing to engage with anybody and everybody. If anybody has any questions about uh, questions, comments, or concerns in regard to what I, what I'm planning on bringing to the table, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, if nothing else, you can go to the, you can go to my Facebook page for Christopher Marks for president 2020. And I blatantly have my phone number right there on there. Give me a call, send me an email, whatever it is, however you feel more, most comfortable reaching out to me, please feel free to reach out to me. Great. Awesome, man. Well, I tell you what, I mean, part of me wants, wants your campaign to really work out. The part of me hopes it falls off the wheels. And so that way you and I can have more discussions about currency and economy and, and legal <laughs> hey, stuff. I mean, it's, it's fascinating. If it, 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 even if it, it, I, I will always have time for, I, I enjoy those kinds of conversations. So anytime you want to actually invite me on to a podcast or something along those lines, feel free to reach out to me. I'm always interested in those kinds of conversations. Awesome. We're going to have several more of these. I'll be sure you're invited to them. We're going to have debates. We're going to have discussions. This is the first wave of interviews where I asked everybody canned questions. We'll hit you with some curveballs next time, and I'll be, I'll be sure that uh, you get the invite as well. So I know this won't be the last time. But uh, Chris, again, thank you so much for uh, coming on the show and being with us today and, and telling us what you're all about. I know you're new to me, so I know you're new to a lot of people, but I was, uh, I, I'm excited by what I hear. Well, thank you very much, and thank you very much for inviting me to this and to your future endeavors. <laughs> you got it. Well, folks, that was Chris Marks. He was gracious enough to make the time. He's running for president. Please help him out with the campaign. If, uh, if, if he sounds like he floats your boat, we'd love, uh, we'd love for this to be a profitable venture for him. And for us, too, of course, we're libertarians. We have a Patreon. We couldn't do it without you guys donating to us, and uh, it really keeps us going. Again, you can find us, use our Facebook, find our website at wearelibertarians.com. Give us a listen. Check out our episodes. I'm doing with all of the candidates, and so if you're looking for 
for an apples to apples comparison. I ask them all the same questions and they give uh, wildly different answers, but I love it. So again, thank you for tuning in and we look forward to seeing you next time.